بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد. Uh, so uh, we are going to be talking about Surah Al-An'am uh, which has to do with uh, cattle and uh, the reason that it is named after that is because of the uh, cattle that are mentioned uh, in it and uh, the different rulings that are associated with it. Uh, the Surah was revealed in Mecca and uh, there are a number of different benefits of this surah. Uh, so inshallah today, tabarak wa ta'ala, we are going to be starting from verse number 74. Uh, and this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's statement, وَإِذْ قَالْ إِبْرَاهِيمُ لِأَبِيهِ آزَرْ أَتَّتَّخِذُوا أَصْنَامًا آلِهَةً إِنِّي أَرَاكَ وَقَوْمَكَ فِي ظَالِمْ مُبِينَ so uh, there is actually an entire story here. What I'd like to do is I'd like to mention some important points that are related to each particular verse. And then after that, inshallah, I want to take these ayah as a group and take out the benefits that are associated with that. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about and the first thing I wanted to discuss over here is uh, the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he says, remember when Ibrahim said to his father Azar, how can you take idols as gods? I see that you and your people have clearly gone astray. And the reason that uh, he is called Azar is this is because what the Arabs knew him as, and this is what they called him, and they took a lot of pride, obviously, in knowing their lineage. And this is something that uh, the Arabs were very well known for. But if you go back to a lot of the Christian works and what the Ahl Kitab have to say, they don't know him to be Azar. Uh, they don't call him Azar, they call him uh, Tarih. Uh, and they say, and so some of the Muslim scholars, how they respond to that is they say that Azar was actually a nickname, uh, the same way that we use the word Sheikh today, uh, or somebody who is aged or somebody who is, you know, uh, older. Uh, it's also said that Azar was the name that Ibrahim's father, it was the name of the idol that Ibrahim's father used to worship and the idol that he used to care for. Uh, there are some of the Shia claim that it was actually his uncle and the reason they say that is because they say it is not possible from any one of the uh, lineage of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or from his fathers specifically and, and immediate relatives that they would uh, not, not be Muslim. Uh, there is no historical basis uh, for this claim but uh, because of the premise that they put forward this is the actual reason that they say that and it was just something I wanted uh, you guys to be aware of. Uh, and the reason that Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam, the, he actually mentions this. So, so when he says, how can you take idols as gods? He's not really asking them. Uh, this is kind of his way of uh, ins insulting them. And we do a, something very similar in English as well. When we say, you know, how could you do that? Or how is it possible that you would do something like that? Or how foolish? And, and this is his way of kind of insulting them, of kind of looking down on them. So it, what is interesting to note here is that he, he, call, he says, to his father, you know, this is the way that he's addressing him. But if you look in other ayat, when it comes earlier in the story, or when it, story, when Ibrahim is actually talking to him, he says, Ya Abiti, you know, he speaks to him in a very kind way. He speaks to him in a very soft way. This is actually after all those conversations uh, had done. And basically the relationship now is kind of broken down. Um, and and uh, the relationship that he had in the discussion that he has, it has become uh, very aggressive. At this point, you know, the, the softness that he والسلام, had began with is kind of lost. And we, and we see this uh, in this verse in the way that he's actually addressing his, his father. Uh, you know, and even the harshness that uh, there is in the in the tone that we find here, you know, how can you take idols as gods? You know, what what, you, what were you thinking? Or why would you even say something like that? Or why would you do something like that? I see that you and your people have clearly gone astray. And, and another thing here, he says, in the Araka wa qawmak. He is like, I see you and your people as if he's not from them, as if he has no relationship to them, as if he's completely distanced himself from them, alayhi salatu was salam. So it, it is really interesting to see, you know, how you, you can actually see Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam frustration come out in this verse. And, and he's still young at this time, you know, so you can see the, the zealous youth, you can see the fiery youth that is in Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, and you can see how he's dealing with his father, how he's extremely frustrated, uh, dealing with his people, uh, the frustration that's, that's there. And it really comes out very clearly uh, in this verse. And, and when he says here, he says that in the Araka wa Qomak, I see that you and your people have clearly gone astray. And in the seeing, meaning that I physically see you going astray, I physically see you falling into misguidance, I physically see you, you know, uh, go, going on this evil path, on this on this uh, curved path, the stray path. And 
I am trying to do my best to help you. You know, I, I really want to help you. I want you to to come back to guidance, but I see you going down this and I see you straying on this path, both physically and metaphorically. And, and like I said, we have, what we have to see here, this is basically a culmination of his efforts. He's gotten to the point of frustration now where he's actually addressing them like that because you don't find this in earlier discussions with Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam. And the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَذَلِكَ نُرِيَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مَلَكُوتُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَيْكُونَ مِنَ الْمُوْقِنِينَ And in this way, we showed Ibrahim Allah's mighty dominion over the heavens and the earth so that he might be a firm believer. And there are a couple of ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have actually showed Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam how this happened. It could be that there is direct revelation, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly revealed to Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam, uh, and he told him and he, uh, he, he, you know, very directly saying that, you know, I am your Lord and this is the reason you need to believe in me. And he gave him all of the logical arguments that uh, he presents or it, it was that uh, because it was known from Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, that he actually used to visit a cave, you know, and, and this is very much in line and very similar to our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam when he used to go and seclude himself in a cave. So it said that he used to go and seclude himself in this cave. And it was in that time that he, you know, he looked up in the sky and he actually pondered over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's dominion. And he came to this conclusion independently, meaning that without revelation. And, and this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very much uh, pointedly does to us and gives us this, this tool saying that, well, when you call to a person to Islam and you want to invite him to the concept that there is only one God, you want to invite him to the concept that there is only one creator, then one of the major signs that you can give them, give them is by looking at the world around us. Uh, so, you know, there are two types of ayat. There are two types of signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. There are ayat al -kawniya and there are ayat al -shari -ya. So these ayat al -kawniya are the worldly signs which we see around us and the ayat al uh, whether they be miracles, you know, like like the Quran, or sometimes they could be smaller miracles, you know, that, that we see sometimes from the righteous, or you know, miracle great miracles that we see from the prophets. Uh, these are all different ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala convinces uh, individuals of, of his existence and the truth of Islam. So, like we said, you know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed him the his sovereignty, he showed him his dominion over the heavens and the earth. It could have happened in one of these two ways. And either is very plausible, either of them is very reasonable. You know, if if we look at the intelligence of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam and how he kind of dealt with himself, uh, how he kind of evolved, how he grew, and, and you know, how strong his arguments were when dealing with the people in front of him, we definitely see the intelligence there and we see how he deals and how he speaks and how he debates with others. Uh, in the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَمَّا جَنَّ عَلَيْهِ لَيْلْ رَأَى كَوْكَبًا قَالَ هَذَا رَبِّي فَلَمَّا أَفَلَا قَالَ لَا أُحِبُّ الْآفِلِينَ that when the night grew dark over him, he saw a star and said, this is my Lord. But when it set, he said, I do not like things that set. So it's important to note here that he, alayhi salatu salam, was actually looking at a particular star. He wasn't looking at the stars as a whole. Uh, there was a particular star that was brighter than the other stars. And uh, he, and that is the one that drew his attention. And that is the one that he actually caused him to say what he did, alayhi salatu salam. And the next ayah, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us, saying, فَلَمَّا جَنَّ عَلَيْهِ اللَّيْلِ رَأَى كَوْكَبًا قَالَ هَذَا رَبِّي فَلَمَّا أَفَلَا قَالَ لَا أُحِبُّ الْآفِلِينَ um, I'm sorry. Uh, the next ayah, فَلَمَّا رَعَى الْقَمَرَ بَازِغًا قَالَ هَذَا رَبِّي فَلَمَّا أَفَلَا قَالَ لَإِنْ لَمْ يَهْدِنِي رَبِّي لَأَكُونَنَّا مِنَ الْقَوْمِ الضَّالِّينَ uh, and when he saw the moon rising, he said, this is my Lord. But when it too set, he said, if my Lord does not guide me, I shall be one of those who go astray. In the following ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَمَّا رَعَى شَمْسِ بَازِغَةً قَالَ هَذَا رَبِّي هَذَا أَكْبَرُ فَلَمَّا أَفَلَتْ قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ إِنِّي بَرِيءٌ مِمَّا تُشْرِكُونَ That when he saw the sun rising, he cried, this is my Lord, this is greater. But when the sun set, he said, my people, I disown all that you worship beside Allah. And he goes on to say, alayhi salam, inni wajahtu wajhi lilladhi fatar as-samawati wal-ard hanifan wa ma ana min al-mushrikeen. I have turned my face as a true believer toward him who created the heavens and the earth. I am not one of the polytheists. I am not one of the pagans. وَحَاجِ قَوْمُهُ قَالَ أَتُحَاجُونِ فِي اللَّهِ وَقَدْ هَدَانِي ولا أخاف ما تشركون به إلا أن يشاء ربي شيئا وسع ربي كل شيء علما أفلا تتذكرون that his people argued with him and he said 
How can you argue with me about Allah when he has guided me? I do not fear anything you associate with him. Unless my Lord wills, nothing can happen. My Lord encompasses everything in his knowledge. How can you not take heed? وَكَيْفَ أَخَافَ مَا أَشْرَكْتُمْ وَلَا تَخَافُونَ أَنَّكُمْ أَشْرَكْتُمْ بِاللَّهِ مَا لَمْ يُنَزِّلْ بِهِ عَلَيْكُمْ سُلْطَانٍ فَأَيِّ الْفَرِيقَيْنِ أَحَقُّ بِالْأَمْنِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ That why should I fear what you associate with him? Why do you not fear to associate with him things for which he has sent you no authority? Tell me if you know the answer, which side has more right to feel secure? الذين آمنوا ولم يلبسوا إيمانا بظلم أولئك لهم الأمن وهم مهتدون. It is those who have faith and do not mix their faith with idolatry who will be secure and it is they who are rightly guided. وتلك حجتنا آتينا ها إبراهيم على قومه نرفع درجات من نشاء إن ربك حكيم عليم. Such was the argument we gave to Ibrahim against his people. We raise in rank whoever we will. Your Lord is all wise, all knowing. So, like we had said before, this entire conversation, and and there's one eye after this, which we will talk about in the end, inshallah, because it's not directly tied in uh, to these sets of verses, because this is what the conversation was, and what the debate was that Ibrahim والسلام, was having with his people. Um, but like we said, that the point that we're at in the story here is when Ibrahim والسلام, he had grown a little bit older, uh, he has become a, a more... Um, more formative in how he, he speaks. He's becoming a little bit more aggressive in how he speaks. He had been calling these individuals, uh, including his father and his people to Islam for this entire time. And he had become frustrated with how they kept worshiping these idols. Um, so what happens is that you, you see him talking about a star and you're talking about a moon and then talking about the sun. And it's very interesting when, when you actually look at, look at how Ibrahim والسلام, he's preparing his argument to introduce this concept of alone creator you know he and he goes one by one he doesn't talk about like groups you know he talks about one star one moon and then one sun you know introducing all of these celestial bodies one at a time and how he uses the word lord you know so he calls all of these Rabb, and this is my lord and then this is my lord and then this is my lord and if you look at the gradation uh, when he's actually talking about when he's address, addressing all of these celestial bodies you'll find that in first he starts with the star which has the least light then the moon which has more light and then he talks about finally, finally the sun which has the greatest or the the uh, the most light in all of this so what, what's going on here is if you actually look at the the people of Ibrahim or the Qom Ibrahim, uh, there there is a difference of opinion amongst the scholars on how how to actually deal with them. So some of the scholars say that uh, you had a group of them who worship these idols, and you had a group of them that worship these celestial bodies. But Allahu Alam, it would seem more so like they they were very much like the uh, what we know about the Greek and the Roman religions uh, and the pagan religion that they had, meaning that uh, they would worship these celestial bodies that were up in the sky, and then. What they did is they would actually create these idols as represent uh, representations of those celestial bodies that are in the sky. So you know, even when we look at uh, the story of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, uh, we find that uh, the, these people they were go going out tonight, uh, going out at night to celebrate their festival, and the reason for that is because that's when their gods were out. Uh, and you know, during the day they would actually worship those idols because those gods were absent. So it, it's really interesting uh, how how you can really find parallels between what they were doing and what the Greeks and the Romans were doing. And um, another interesting thing to know is that even though they have this concept of a, a Zeus or a master god, the the uh, element of shirk that they had and, and the biggest problem of shirk that they had was that they believed that not only did this god create all these other gods or this master god who created all these other gods, those gods he created they actually had the ability to challenge him um and and this is the this is the thing that ibrahim wanted to completely break this idea of of you know challenging the power of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and that he alone is the one that controls everything he is the one he cannot be challenged he is a complete sovereign uh, there is no deity save him there's no deity of worship uh, worthy of worship other than than him the other thing or the other point of note here is that when Ibrahim والسلام, when he was talking about the, these individual uh, celestial bodies, he wasn't telling them, he wasn't um, he wasn't actually addressing them in, in a way that he was making shirk. He was doing it to debate. 
uh, he believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he firmly believed in that. What he was doing, he was just setting up the debate and he was setting up the arguments to, to against the uh, against the idolaters or against the pagans who were in his village and from his people. And, and this is something that is very commonly done, done in debates, like where um, one of the debaters will say, okay, it, well, if I accept you know, this argument, then based on this argument, I would have to understand this, this, this. It doesn't mean that he's actually accepted them in, internally and he's actually submitted to those arguments. It just means, okay, for argument's sake, if I accept what you what you're saying, then I see the flaws here, here, and here. And this is exactly what Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, you know. And if we look at you know the great debater in the Quran, it, it is him alayhi salatu wasalam, and, and how he he prepares all of these logical arguments, how he brings all of these things forward. And, and if you actually look and you analyze all these things, you'll find they're very strong debate techniques that you know definitely are used uh, up until today. Um, the next thing is that, uh, like I said, you know, when, when it comes to this understanding of these deities and these gods, uh, we have to understand that Ibrahim, والسلام, he had already talked about, okay, well, I, I'm going to destroy this argument of yours where you worship these, these idols that cannot speak, cannot do anything. And even you know that, and you know that these are just representations. And I will also destroy this argument of worshiping these beings that, okay, even you understand that they're not there all the time. So if they're not there all the time, it is almost as if they're not omni omnipresent in the sense that they're all not always watching us you know they had there is a time where they even they go away um and in this is this this idea or this fact that they are not omnipresent is the main crux argument that Ibrahim والسلام, is trying to present to them like listen they're not there all the time and because they're not there all the time you build these these statues as representations of them in order to uh, to deal with that in order to compensate for that shortcoming and in the last ayah uh, that of discussion today Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wahabna lahu ishaq wa yaqub kullan hadayna wa nuhan wa hadayna min qabl wa min dhurriyati dawud wa sulayman wa ayyub wa yusuf wa musa wa harun wa kadhalika najil muhsinin that we gave ishaq and yaqub each of whom we guided as we had guided nuh before and among his descendants were dawud sulayman <coughs> ayyub yusuf musa and harun in this way we reward those who do good and it's interesting how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses each of these individuals uh, some of them sons some of them grandsons uh, some of them father and son uh, some of them brothers um you know and some of them we will find that it is their father was non-muslim but one of their sons or one of their sons was non-muslim and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically he he's showing here family dynamics and he's showing that there there are a few things here that ibrahim even though we see him to be alone look at the legacy that he created you know look at the legacy that he created and look at those that followed him and this is why Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam he, even though one of his, even though his wife and his son they disbelieved he alayhi salatu wasalam look at the progeny and look at the descendants that came after him in one of the the uh, greatest duas that Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam had made for himself and he had hope for himself is that he would actually create this righteous legacy he would leave behind this righteous legacy and he constantly made dua for that and if we look at his life alayhi salatu wasalam it was much later on you know that that he had children and that he even saw that there was a lineage from that and, and from both of his sons we find a lineage of prophethood so from uh, ishaq you know there's prophet after prophet after prophet until we get to isa they salatu salam and then from ismail we have ismail and then there was you know then his lineage continued until the finality of the coming of our messenger muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam so wallahu alam it would seem that the connection between this ayah and the verse before it is how if an individual is upon correct is upon sound tawheed and he asks and he makes dua for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow him to leave behind a legacy, then that legacy definitely can be left behind. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who leave behind a legacy and who die upon tawheed and who are able to proselytize it, call to it, and allow it to continue. Wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu ala khayri khalqin. Nabiya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Mujazak wa khair. So inshallah, the first question. Um, as we talk about Ibrahim alayhi salam, uh, it's only natural to be thinking about the uh, establishment of the Kaaba, the uh, establishment of Tawheed and our Deen in, in Mecca. And with the coronavirus that's going on today and the state of Mecca and the inability of people to do Tawaf around the Kaaba, can you provide us some reflections on 
how we should be thinking about what's going on at the Kaaba uh, today um, in relation to everything that Ibrahim al-Islam did in terms of all the du'as he made uh, for the establishment of the deen in this area. What should be the feelings that go through us uh, today? Well, I, I can't dictate what you feel. You know, um, obviously, what you feel is is completely normal, and you know, it, whether it be sadness, whether it be anger, whether it be frustration, all of these are completely normal. Uh, I, I cannot expect someone to be completely happy in, in this situation, and if you are, mashallah, you are at a level of iman that I wish I was at. Um, you know, all of us are extremely frustrated. All of us are are very upset. You know, even. My, I'm, I'm home now you know, with my kids. I, I work at the masjid and it is very frustrating for me to, to go there. It is very upsetting for me to go there and, and not see anybody. You know, I never thought, wallahi, I never thought in my entire life that I would one day have to make a istikhara on whether I'm going to cancel Juma or not. So, so the fact that you know the pe people aren't don't have access to the Kaaba, I, I believe Tawaf is still going on, but I, th I think it's only on the roof. I don't think it's going on on any of the other floors, uh, and the Salah is happening, but it's only happening with a select group of people. They're not opening it up to the public. So, so Alhamdulillah, that that is still continuing. But even if it wasn't, even if it wasn't, you know, because there were a few times in history where the Tawaf did stop. That doesn't mean that the religion has stopped. You know that that is one of our religious symbols, for no doubt. But it is not the basis of our religion. Even the Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he asked the people, you know, what month is this? They said this is al hijjah He said, what day is this? They said this is, you know, the uh, the day of slaughter. And he said, what uh, what place are we in? He said, you know, we're in the Kaaba. So he said that the blood of the Muslim is more more holy. It is more sacred than this place in this time in this month you know so the the sanctity of the muslim is more important than any of these things and it's very important for us to keep that in mind uh that that these things are sacred you know the muslim is sacred and islam is from the heart alhamdulillah we're not connected to a particular place uh we're not connected to a, you know a particular uh you know a per personality in the sense that he is to be he's the one that is to be worshiped we are connected to him because we are supposed to follow him sallallahu alaihi wasallam even umar radiallahu an when he kissed the black stone he said i i am only kissing you because I saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam kissing you, and I know you have no power to hurt me or to benefit me. So, so you know, it, it is a building, and there are rights that are associated with it. And is it a holy space? And on and is it close to all of our hearts? Yes, you know, I'm, I'm definitely with that, and I agree with that sentiment. But Alhamdulillah, Islam still continues, uh, and it, it will continue in our hearts, and it has to continue with our, in our families. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to give us tawfiq, uh, because this is what Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam wanted. It, it, it it wasn't for him, it was continuing his legacy through his children, through practicing. Whether, you know, a place stood or a building stood or not, it, it was irrelevant to him. It was more important for him that his family continued practicing. And, and you know, subhanAllah, look at the legacy that he, alayhi salatu wasalam, left behind. Jazakallah khair. Did the Prophet Ibrahim, alayhi salam, use his reasoning or did he literally experience the stars? like the Prophet ﷺ's journey to the heavens before concluding about the oneness of Allah. Okay, so uh, I, did, I did definitely touch on this uh, during the during the tafsir, but he, والسلام, one of two things could have happened, I and mean, this either either possibility is very realistic, in that he والسلام, actually sat down and he pondered over that. You know, he didn't have a uh, he didn't have a miraculous journey like the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had the miraculous journey. I believe that was very unique uh, to him, the Isra wa Miraj. But uh, what had happened to Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, either one of two, like I said, either he had uh, a divine communication, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down wahi, uh, he sent down this uh, revelation to him, and that was convincing enough for him, or he was given some of those arguments, or at least the yaqeen in his heart, where he was able to present the arguments uh, that, that he saw sound, or he alayhi salatu wasalam, just by pondering and looking at the world around him, he came to an independent conclusion that that this was, uh, you know, this was the correct religion and that there is only one Allah and anything else and everything else is not worthy of his worship. And Allah knows best. Jazakallah khair. Um, what is the history and origin of the word Akida? Uh, is the word Akida mentioned in the Quran? Uh, no, it's not uh, there. I think Aqada might be, but I, I can't recall. I, I'll, I can look it up. But the word Aqida in and of itself is not. Uh, 
and give me one second. Uh, like you know, uh, yeah, it's it's in the it's it's used in the sense where because the word aqidah it actually comes from the word aqada which basically means to tie like to tie something so you'll find it mentioned in the quran in a few places but it has to do uh with uh, tying a knot you know or or in a mar in marital sense it's not used in the sense of belief uh versus you know worshiping allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone in the idea of tawheed which does this which does come in the quran as muslims we all know that we have to strive to um, serve our parents uh, as part of our relationship with Allah. What tips can we get from the verses that we've studied today that we can implement in our lives to make better our relationships with our parents? Uh, that we constantly have to keep uh, that that communication open with our parents. So I think that is something that is very fundamental uh, that many of us uh, fail in, and that we have to always and constantly communicate with them. Uh, we have to be respectful uh, when we deal with them. But as we look with the story of Ibrahim Ali Sadsam, we don't always have to agree with them. Uh, we can we can absolutely and even fundamentally disagree on many points, but that, that does not give us the right to disrespect them in any way. Uh, the only time where Ibrahim, you know, when Ibrahim when he drew the final line in the sand was when, when his father said, I'm going to stone you to death. Basically, he's threatening to kill him. And this is the only time that we find Ibrahim, this is where he backs off and he says, OK, you know, the conversation's over now. There's nothing more I can do in this situation. So I think that's a huge lesson for, for all of us that we have to keep those lines of communication open as best as possible. Um, and that the, the line to draw on where an individual should maybe, you know, think about and reanalyze his relationship with his parents is if they actually you know threaten to uh, hurt him or hurt her physically okay. during the verses that we've studied today um, much of the topic is about uh, reasoning and logic with respect to inviting to the truth um, what tips should a da'i take from these verses? Somebody who wants to be active in inviting people to the deen? Uh, maybe just two or three tips for, for the, for the da'i. Sure. Well, uh, I think the first thing in, the, in, in uh, a major benefit that we could take away, or a major talking point we can take away from these verses, is identifying who, you know the audience. I, I think that's very important. If if that person doesn't believe in God at all, or he is a pagan or a polytheist, well, we have to actually bring him to step one, which is believing in the oneness of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And then we can introduce all of these other concepts. But uh, you can't say, okay, well, you know, you need to accept Islam, and the person says why, and you tell them, well, because the Quran says so. It's a very it's a very circular argument. You're not really going to get very far uh, with that, that type of logic. So I think one thing that we can take away from this is knowing your audience. Uh, secondly, uh, using the the tools that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has given us, and there, like I had mentioned, there are two major tools that He has given us. Uh, those being the worldly signs around us, and those and the other signs being the miraculous one. The the major one being the Quran. So uh, understanding the audience and knowing how to use the tools that we have, these are d definitely very fundamental to a da'i in understanding and moving forward, and, and somebody who's very well, you know, somebody who's wise and somebody who understands how to give da'wah. Jazakallah. Um, for those of us who have non-Muslim relatives, uh, what can we learn from the verses today uh, and put into perspective in terms of our relationships with non-Muslim relatives? And especially in the era that we live in where religion uh, is often seen as something you don't talk about in society, it's becoming more and more of a private matter with the rise of secularism. Um, how can religion be brought into conversations um, generally, but more specifically with uh, you know, those of us who have non-Muslim relatives? Uh, it, it depends on the person. So again, it's very important to understand your audience. Uh, and understand who it is that you're speaking to. So if you all, if you bring up religion with, with somebody and they're turned off immediately or they stop listening to you, this is not the best way to establish a relationship with them because if you know whether they're non-Muslim or Muslim or whatever, uh, it's very important to keep family ties. It's very important to keep those relationships intact. 
uh, and you don't want to do anything to harm or hurt those relationships because dawa is uh, there are different types of dawa uh, there is active dawa in the sense that you're actively calling a person and telling them hey islam is the correct religion islam is a great religion uh, and these are the reasons i think you should accept islam and then you have passive dawa which is basically calling a person to Islam with your actions, uh, calling a person to Islam with your mannerisms, calling a person to Islam with your good behavior. Uh, and all of these are very attractive means for people to accept Islam. There are a number of people that have accepted Islam just because of the behavior and because of the way that people dealt with them. Uh, so, you know, it's very important to understand, again, these are these are all the tools of, that the Muslim has available to him. You know, is it necessary that I have a con conversation about Islam every time I meet with this person? No, absolutely not. I, I don't think it's necessary at all. Um, you, you know, uh, it's, it's important to understand your audience. It's important to understand how to call the people uh, to, to Islam. And, and, you know, and come back to the conversation time and time again. It's, it's not something that needs to be constantly hammered into their heads because they're just going to get annoyed. Uh, and, and you don't want that to happen. You want them to to love you. Uh, you want them to love everything you stand for. And, you know, in the end, you know, we all want them to love Islam. And, and that can only happen through loving you. Jazakallah, Ken. Um, as we approach Dawah uh, in the current environment, obviously we are in a situation of self-isolation with everything going on with coronavirus um what are perhaps some alternative ways where we can still be engaged in the work of dawah um, when we're not interacting directly with people oh well you know beginning dawah with ourselves this is a great opportunity for an individual to better his personal relationship with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and if i'm better to if i'm able to better my relationship with him if i'm able to take this khalwa if i'm able to isolate myself and actually better my relationship with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spend time with his book uh, trying to understand it then i will come out of this situation a better person and i could be a better da'i and i can have better interactions with people uh, saying that there are still many opportunities that uh, the local county and the local cities are offering uh, to to citizens in volunteering in terms of delivering meals, in terms of being involved. So uh, those are definitely means that uh, people should look into taking advantage of and there are precautions that they have in place and that they put in place. Uh, I know the local public school system, they have a, uh, they have a food program for those who are less privileged financially. And it's, it's amazing how all of these guys, what they're doing is that because the kids can't come to school for breakfast and lunch or dinner any, or breakfast and lunch anymore, what they're doing is they're actually sending the food on the bus and people can actually go pick up the food. So just imagine, you know, being one of those people who's delivering the food and, and they see, you know, they see a Muslim. You know, it, it's very powerful. It's a very powerful message, you know, and uh, Meals on Wheels is, is uh, they have a program going on, you know, locally. I, I think these are great means of da'wah. There are great ways to get out there and there's great ways to contribute back to the community. Uh, so there are a number of avenues out there. It's just a matter of, you know, taking advantage of them. And not just that, mashallah, you know, even even Ikna Helping Hands, uh, they're providing a lot of services. Uh, there are a lot of uh, restaurants that are stepping up. There are a lot of uh, Islamic centers stepping up now. So alhamdulillah, there are a number of opportunities uh, that we can take advantage of uh, even even during this crisis and I, I would say even more so you know there are even more opportunities now it's just upon the moment to seize them Jazakallah khair. Um, how can we spread Islam starting from schools um, I, with your actions, I think that's that's the best way to to do that. And the thing is, you know, uh, if you're given an opportunity to talk about religion, I think that's a good way to do that. Um, you have a little bit more leeway as you get older. So, like in high school and college, uh, having an Islamic Awareness Week or you know having a Muslim Week or whatever, you know, all of all of these are very reasonable ways of presenting da'wah, of giving da'wah, of calling people to Islam. Um, in the in the younger grades, it, it can be a little bit more challenging because you know most kids, <laughs> frankly, aren't re interested in religion but um there, there are more subtle ways of doing that again you know uh, sending gifts to school on eight for for the for the entire class you know whether it be like chips or candy or whatever um just so that they're aware of that uh, you know maybe during ramadan um you know the kids praying lohar in school you know when when the, the days are shorter so there are a number of different ways uh, to to get involved in that uh, and be part of that or even ex having the child excused you know having them excused for example uh, if you're of the opinion that music is uh, haram you know having your kids excused from that um, dietary restrictions you know letting the school know 
what those dietary restrictions are, you know, what the, what the kids can eat and what they can't eat. Um, and there, there are a lot of subtle ways. There are a lot of subtle ways of kind of giving Tao and calling people to that and in, inviting friends over, you know, and, and again, you, you don't want to, uh, if you start op openly proselytizing and calling to Islam, uh, most parents will stop sending their kids to your house. But, you know, it's a great way of just calling them over, you know, and making seeing who your kids' friends are and things like that. So, you know, t take advantage. Again, it's, it's an opportunity and it all depends on how we take advantage of that opportunity. Jazakallah khair. Um, Ibrahim alayhi salam asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to embarrass him by throwing his father into the hellfire. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed his father's form before throwing him in the hellfire. Uh, please confirm it, whether or not this is true, but if so, can you give the significance of this? Well, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, I'm not familiar with that. It's something I'd have I'd have to look up. But it, this is the first time I'm hearing it. Okay. Great, inshallah. Um, uh, that's all of the questions, mashallah. We had a, a lot of questions today, and uh, mashallah, you you went through them very well. Jazakallah khair. Was there anything else you wanted I'm to not add? Not sure. No, you know, I, I understand this is a very hard time. This is a very difficult time. But, uh, you know, the, these programs, you know, especially going back to the Quran, this is something I'm advising everyone to do. Uh, there, there are two things that the coronavirus has given us. You know, a lot of people look at what it's taken away, but there are two major things that it really has given us. Uh, that's the opportunity to self-reflect and spending time with ourselves. Um, and the second opportunity is opportunities with our families, you know, for those who are blessed with them. So I, I really, really am advising and telling and pushing people to take advantage of this opportunity because that's exactly what it is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sometimes he gives things and sometimes he takes them away. But when he takes away something, he gives something in its place. Uh, and and at, this is that time that, you know, I cannot meet my friends. I cannot meet my extended family. Uh, even some of my immediate family, like my parents, I, it's, I can't meet them because, you know, they're older and, and I'm scared of uh, in, infecting them or carrying disease to them. But I, I am forced to spend time with my immediate family. It's just all a matter of how I use this opportunity, how I seize this opportunity. Sign up for classes uh, if you feel you're not educated or you know, go out there. Uh, there, there are a lot of opportunities for people for people to do things alone. Uh, I have a series uh, on this. If you go to uh, the MCNJ uh, website or the Facebook page, there are a series where I talk about how to deal with uh, some of the issues uh, around coronavirus. If anybody wants to take a look at that, inshallah. And maybe just one final question: mm -hmm. um, What is your most favorite or most relevant dua during these times? Mm. Astaghfirullah. The, uh, the, the reason I, I enjoy the Astaghfar so much is it just makes me realize how insignificant I am. And it makes me realize how unable I am and how weak I am and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has power over anything and everything. And there, there's nothing really that I, I can do except through him. Um, and you know it's it's just really powerful for me. You know, just just as simple as I know I know it's very simple, but seeking istighfar and you know seeking this this repentance from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala because I know I have shortcomings, and it, there, it, you know when you when you have crises like this, uh, sometimes those shortcomings come out even more and they come out even stronger. So I ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for thabat, you know, to strengthen us and, and to forgive all of us. Amen. Amen. Jazakallah khair, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu wa ilayk. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa la asr, inna l-insana lafi khus, illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu s-salihat, wa tawasaw bil-haqqi wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Sadaqallahu nazim. Assalamu alaikum. Waalaikum assalam alaikum assalam alaikum. Allah, Allah.